as of now, the guidelines do not recommend uh, prophylaxis with active osteoporosis therapies, either with uh, strontium renine or even bisphosphonates. The recommendation in patients who are osteopenic, and in some patients, particularly the elderly women, in excess of 70 years old, 75 years old, in those cases, in these women with high risk factors, they are, they are um, fragile, they have all the other risk factors for osteoporosis, they may not need to have a T-score less than 2.5 for me to treat. So I might even treat this elderly woman about the age of 75 who's got a BMD of say minus T-score of minus 2, but she has all the other risk factors, steroids, small frames, she's liable to fall, this woman I might treat. So BMD is no longer considered the only parameter for which I decide to treat these patients. And I think that has to be recognised, that the, now the gold standard is assessing future fracture risk. And one of the ways is to look at the FRAX algorithm. Yeah? So my, quest, my answer is no, if you're just pure osteopenia, even minus one, just lifestyle. What is lifestyle? Exercise, calcium, vitamin D. Professor Tin has shown you your calcium intake uh, is actually relatively low. Malaysia is the same. All our women don't take enough calcium. Um, and perhaps um, one of the advice that I'd like to give you is don't worry about the data that's coming from New Zealand, from Professor Ian Reid's st studies that suggest that calcium might increase cardiovascular event rates. I think those in those women, they are all Caucasian, their baseline calcium intake is about 800 milligrams. And on top of them, they intake from diet of about 300 to 400. That's grossly insufficient. And then you tell them, oh, you know, Professor Reed says don't take calcium. And then you tell your patient why this drug doesn't work. Because you don't have enough building block. So milk seems to be like, safe. It's how high the calcium goes when you take it in the form of a tablet. Well, uh, it seems it very um, impressive to prevent the, the, the already weakened bone by taking the, the, the strengthening the bone uh, by taking the protox. But so far, as uh, Dr. Chen has pointed out, it is not uh, recommended so far. The only thing is that um, to strengthen the bone, we need to lead a uh, healthy lifestyle. Uh, every lifestyle means that uh, increased physical activity uh, with the other. Regarding the question today, when we need to do something for the country, we are very obviously very low level. However, I don't think it is appropriate for us. It is, uh, it is good for us to raise to that of the Western standard. So, uh, uh, we are very uh, rightly pointed out that just to raise a few uh, more grants will be enough for us. But another uh, reason for necessity for raising the calcium intake for this country is that uh, we found a very definite association with calcium, no calcium intake, and insulin resistance which will render the people to develop glucose intolerance of various grades. So that will, uh, by raising the calcium, we might reduce the insulin resistance, and also we might reduce the different grade of uh, glucose intolerance, thereby uh, eventually we will be able to reduce the incidence of diabetes. Uh, perhaps, sorry. Oh, sorry. perhaps just vitamin D, remember calcium plus vitamin D. Yeah. Perhaps you might uh, not, don't forget vitamin D. Yeah. 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 Uh, since we need to keep uh, in time, uh, I could uh, perhaps uh, offer only one more, one person, uh, one question. In your slide, uh, you mentioned that strontium renalate can be the first option. So what's the current situation of strong, strontium in osteoporotic treatment? I mean, which factors do you consider in choosing drugs for your osteoporotic patient? Professor Din has already mentioned it. Um, we are now in the, working in an environment where bisphosphonates are already generic. So where that is concerned, again, with regards to budget constraints, uh, the bisphosphonates would still be a very commonly used drug in our armamentarium, because just because it's become generic and much more affordable. Um, however, I would st still state that strontium renulate has the evidence, and where possible, I think these patients can be given strontium renulate. 
I think it's a matter of what you have available and what is affordable. Thank you. Uh, since we have to keep in time, I'll, I'll stop this session now. And I'm very grateful to both speakers for highlighting us a very important fact about osteoporosis, current situations and management related, especially in disruptive remedy. And I'm also grateful for the organizing committee for allowing us to chair this section and also to the audience for a good number of attendance and interesting questions as well. So let's show our appreciation as usual to two speakers and now end up the section. To express our heartfelt thanks to the to, Ms. to the chairpersons for your stimulating leadership during the discussion time, to the speakers for your very interesting and informative lectures, and to all attendees for your lively participation and making this symposium a great success. Before conclusion of our session, Organizing Committee of Myanmar Society of Endocrinology and Metabolism would like to honor the speakers for their contribution of this academic program. For this purpose, we are invite Professor Yedwe to present the gifts as a token of thanks to Professor Ben Suyla. We are invite Professor Ben to present the gifts to Professor S. P. Chen. We are announced that the symposium on new concepts in home health is successfully concluded. Thank you. This morning, we have two eminent speakers, Professor Mark E. Cooper, who is going to deliver his precious experience on the new IDF guidelines and recommendations, the role of sarcoidal ureus in the new millennium. And the second speaker, Professor Chan Su Feng, on the <clears throat> will be the second speaker. 
The first speaker, Professor Mark E. Google, is a Deputy Director of Research in Baker IDI Heart and Diabetes Institute, Director, JDRF, Daniel Alberti Memorial Center for Diabetes Complications, and Head of Diabetes Division, Baker IDI Heart and Diabetes Institute of Melbourne, Australia. He is a very eminent endocrinologist devoted his life to treating patients with diabetes mellitus and research works. I am proud to introduce that he has received multiple prizes from Royal Australian College of Physicians, ADS, and JDRF, and so on and so forth. We are very eager to hear his precious experiences. So without wasting time, may I pro invite Professor Mark E. Cooper to deliver your speech. Thank you. Finally review some of the new clinical trials where we've been using sulfonylureas like diamicron and MIR. So we know that diabetes continues to explode and in particular there's been a major increase in emerging countries. And we can see here that over the next 10 years we will see almost a 50% increase in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. It is clearly a major epidemic and it is affecting all over the world with a 75% increase in Southeast Asia, a 100% increase in India, and very high increase, increases all over the world. And the only place where there are only modest increases are Europe. So if we look at where Myanmar is with respect to this epidemic, you can see here on this slide that, that, uh, is uh, that Myanmar is actually the country with the second lowest prevalence of diabetes in the Western Pacific region. And it's very similar in our prevalence to Vietnam and Laos. But I can tell you this is old data. Thank you. This is old data. And I would predict with the increasing affluence in a country such as Myanmar, we will start to see a change in the prevalence of diabetes. For example, here, although Myanmar is up here, there are other Asian countries that have really had a dramatic increase in affluence with very high prevalence of diabetes, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore. And it is very likely, and I'm sure there are already parts of Myanmar where the prevalence of diabetes is well above 2 to 3%. And I'm sure there are many parts already with prevalence over 10%. So when I was invited to Myanmar, I thought I should do an internet search on diabetes in Myanmar. And what I found was this one book from our, one of our chairpersons, from Dr. Tin Swilat. And I can't read any of this, but I'm sure it's very interesting. And we will hear more, I'm sure, during this meeting with updates on some of the important aspects of diabetes in this part of the world. So where are we with respect to the guidelines? Well, the guidelines for type 2 diabetes are global. They have to accept the diversity of diabetes in the world. And you can see here in the opening of the book that although much of the work was done in Caucasian population, the major burden of diabetes is throughout the world with a very high prevalence in this part of Asia. So why do we want to treat diabetes? Well, of course, there are symptoms from uncontrolled elevated glucose levels. But the real issue is that we're predicting that if we lower glucose, we will reduce the complications. Because we know that there is a relationship between mean glucose or hemoglobin A1C and the depth of complications. So what we would predict is that if we lowered A1C from 7 to 6%, we would see a small reduction in complications. But the real emphasis must be on the very poorly controlled diabetics. And when they drop their A1C, we see a marked reduction in complication burden. So although we are always debating, should it be 7 or 6.5, the real problem is in this area here. With each 1% reduction in A1C, we're seeing at least a 20% reduction in death, macrovascular disease, and microvascular disease. And hopefully with a 2% reduction, 
we will see effects of at least 50% reduction. So what do we do when we treat people with hyperglycemia? Well, currently, if the person is overweight, we would start with metformin, and then we would add a range of drugs. Although this is the general guideline, increasingly we appreciate, particularly from a cost and evidence point of view, that sulfonylureas are probably the next class. And then, ultimately, we may have to add insulin, which, as you know, in most parts of the world, people don't really appreciate that choice of drug. But now when we look at the more recent change in the IVF algorithm in December 2011, you can see now we are generally recommending metformin, then a sulfonyl urea, then insulin. But more and more we have an additional option of starting with a sulfonyl urea. This is particularly relevant in the Asian population, many of whom have a low BMI, are not obese, and may primarily have a problem of beta cell failure. And we'll hear more about that from Professor Chan in the next talk. So what about metformin as the first line therapy? Well, we know metformin is effective. It does not uh, increase and may reduce weight. Very unlikely to cause hypoglycemia unless added to another drug and has low cost. Cannot be used in people with renal impairment, particularly severe renal impairment, and with moderate renal impairment, you have to be very careful. And this is particularly an important problem in Asia, where renal disease is so common in association with diabetes. And there is a possibility of a cardiovascular benefit, although this relies primarily on one study, the UK PDS. Now, recently there's been a meta-analysis of how good is metformin really for reducing cardiovascular disease. And this involves a meta-analysis of 12 studies where they've explored cardiovascular outcomes. And unfortunately, the effect is disappointing. Essentially, there is no real benefit of metformin on cardiovascular disease. And it all really was built on this one study. But now we have a large number of larger studies adopt, record, and these do not show this extra benefit of metformin. So although metformin is neutral, what about sulfonylureas? Well, we are fortunate there's been a recent paper exploring from Denmark the role of various sulfonylureas. Now, this is not a direct randomized control study, so one must interpret the data with caution. Nevertheless, what we see here, if we assume that metformin is a level of one, for all cause death in those with or without previous cardiovascular disease, you can see here that glycoside is essentially associated with no evidence of increased or reduced death compared to metformin. This contrasts with some of the other sulfonylureas, such as glipizide and uh, glomeparide, where you see, if anything, an increase in cardiovascular death. So I think the talk that sulfonylureas are associated with increased cardiovascular death could be sulfonylurea specific. And that an agent such as glycoside does not appear to have this disadvantage. So where are we now today with respect to these guidelines launched more than five years ago and recently edited? Well, a lot has happened in the last seven years. Increasingly, we are studying using hemoglobin A1C for the diagnosis of diabetes. There are many issues here in this, in this, uh, with respect to hemoglobin A1C. I'm not going to talk about them today, but as you know, in Asia we have commonly thalassemia, it affects hemoglobin levels, renal disease affects hemoglobin A1C, and it may be that some of the conventional opinions of relation between glucose and hemoglobin A1C are more relevant to Caucasians than to Asian or African Americans. There's been a lot of intervention with community diabetes prevention programs. We have some new drugs, DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 analogs, although the long-term data, the safety data, the outcome data are still awaited. Thiazolin diets such as rosiglizone and pyoglizone are not as popular as originally when they wrote these guidelines. They seem to have fluid retention, they have this bone problem, and rosiglizone results have been suggested to be associated with increased rather than neutral effects on cardiovascular disease. 
We know that we need to explore more than just glucose. Steno2 emphasizes lipid lowering, blood pressure lowering, and the advanced study and other large scale clinical trials, such as Accord and VADT, give us some more understanding of the importance of glucose lowering in type 2 diabetes. So, where are we today? Well, we intervene diet, exercise, lifestyle, drugs, and the main thing we want to do is to reduce the complications of diabetes, in particular mortality, kidney disease, eye disease, cardiovascular disease. But we have to look at the different uh, cost-benefit relationship for all the different interventions. <coughs> we know there are side effects with some drugs, hypoglycemia, weight gain, specific side effects such as the bone disease that we see with thiazoline diodes, the possible increase in bladder cancer with pyoglucosone. And then we have to look very importantly at other considerations, particularly relevant in a country such as Myanmar, cost and availability of the various drugs. So we use as an intermediate outcome hemoglobin A1C. And at present, we assume that the reduction in A1C translates to a reduction in various outcomes. But it may be, in some, to a certain extent, drug specific. So the IDF emphasizes, particularly in the emerging countries of the world, the importance of cost and availability of drugs. And this, I think, is a very important perspective which should be considered here because a lot of the literature, the publications, are dominated by very affluent Western countries where price is not such a big option. So what about treatments for type 2 diabetes? And the largest study in this area is the advanced study with over 11,000 patients which involve both a blood pressure lowering and a glucose lowering arm. And the important feature of this study is that it was global. It involved people from Caucasian countries, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, but importantly, had a very large number from Asian countries, including India and China. And you can see here, although Myanmar was not included in the trial, there are many countries with subjects that would be relevant to the population here. A significant number in India, a large number in China, Philippines and Malaysia. So I think with one third of the people from the advanced study being of Asian and predominantly Chinese origin, we have a lot of information that is relevant to this country. So what was the question of the advanced study? Well, in those people with type 2 diabetes, it was presumed, hypothesized, that lowering glucose with a sulfonylurea glycoside MR-based regimen would lower the risk of complications. And this would be, in a 2 by 2 factorial design, involve another group where there was intensive blood pressure lowering. And all subjects were allowed in the study, irrespective. It didn't matter what was the baseline hemoglobin A1C. What was done to improve glucose control in the advanced study? What was done is something that all of us in this room can do as clinicians. More frequent visits, emphasis on lifestyle, and titrating the dose of the drug based on the level of glucose or hemoglobin A1C. So first, the glycoside dose was maximized, and then other agents were added, such as metformin. It was a small use of rosiglinazone. Then people would have long acting insulin, and in a very small group, very poorly controlled, we would have to use multiple insulin injections. And indeed, in this study, there was a gradual reduction in hemoglobin A1C, so that the difference between the standard intensive control group was just under 1%. And the main endpoint was a combination of micro and macrovascular complications. And you can see there was this 10% reduction in these complications. Unfortunately, there was no effect on mortality, although the important finding was that in contrast to the ACCORD study, which used a totally different treatment 
approach, we saw no increase in mortality, and maybe after four years, we're starting to see some division of the groups. Although we don't yet know, and hopefully with the follow-up study that's currently being uh, performed called Advance On, we will see some more information. So the advanced study, the reduction in deaths is primarily cardiovascular. There is no effective increased non-cardiovascular death, and so this treatment is working as we would predict. As I said, the major macrovascular complications, a 6% non-statistical reduction, but you're starting to see this small difference after four years. It will be interesting to see what happens in a few years' time. The main benefit was on microvascular complications, a 14% reduction in a combination of retinopathy and nephropathy, although most of the effect was in nephropathy. And indeed, we see a spectacular effect on end-stage kidney disease with over a 60% reduction in end-stage kidney disease, meaning reduced dialysis and transplantation. This is a very important finding because in many parts of the world, when people reach this stage, it's essentially death, since many people elect not to have dialysis or there is no availability of transplantation. So what glucose control is doing, it is reducing significantly one of the most devastating complications of diabetes, which is end-stage kidney failure. Now, we've looked back now at this relationship of A1C in both the treated and untreated groups to look at the relationship. Is there a certain level of glucose that is particularly important for these complications? And it's shown here that death, it runs at about 7%. In cardiovascular complications, it seems that the turning point is around 7%, whereas for kidney disease, it's 6.5%. So I think the guidelines emphasize that we are trying to get down to at least 7%, and maybe in some people, we could get down to 6.5%. But definitely the current guidelines vary from 65 to 7%, fit in very nicely with contemporary results from studies such as advanced. So we know that in diabetes and the complications, it's not just the glucose. We know from the UK PDS, as A1C goes up, we see an increase in micro and macro vascular complications. But very importantly, there is also a relationship to blood pressure. As systolic blood pressure goes up, we see an increase in both micro and macrovascular complications. So it was very important in the advanced study not only to look at glucose lowering, but also blood pressure lowering. And we are fortunate that we had four groups in this study. If we look over here at the left, you can see here, we have the group that received neither. No glucose lowering, no blood pressure lowering, just blood pressure lowering, just glucose lowering, do both and you get the best result. We see the same effect with cardiovascular death and with renal disease, it seems to be the contribution is 50% glucose, 50% blood pressure. So it's very important when you see a diabetic patient, even though we are endocrinologists who think mostly about glucose, not to forget other risk factors such as blood pressure and lipids. So we have our patient. This is one of my patients, a Caucasian patient. He comes in to see me. I tell him, stop smoking, stop drinking, no more salt, no more red meat, no more sweets, don't snack between meals, do more exercise, and enjoy life. Thank you very much.
May I call upon the speaker, Professor S. P. Chan, to give a talk on selecting the right stuff on urea as fast line therapy in type 2 diabetes. Uh, good morning again, and uh, my my talk this. Thank you very much. I need to have help. <laughs> yeah, now I can see you. <laughs> right. Uh, talking on uh, diabetes now, and to discuss with you the evidence behind why I still use a lot of sulfonylurea in patients that I manage. And I believe that you will have very similar type of patients. So in the next 20-25 uh, minutes, I want to talk about some of the issues surrounding uh, sulfonylurea. Whether or not I believe that there is any problems to uh, using sulfonylurea, whether I believe that there is beta cell exhaustion because sulfonylurea stimulate the pancreas and the beta cell. But uh, I'll show you the data after this. I believe, as Professor Cooper has already outlined to you, that the Asian type 2 diabetic tends to be smaller frame, have a lower body mass index, and therefore, why is it that there are so, di so many diabetics here? I, I will show you some data to, sh to uh, discuss and to illustrate the fact that the beta cell dysfunction is one of the dominant problems that you and I will face when we manage our patients with type 2 diabetes. The protection in terms of renal protective uh, effect of improving glucose control in the advanced trial, whether it is relevant to our patients, and what is the uh, sort of like problems that we see in our type 2 diabetics with regard to diabetic nephropathy. I would also use the advanced data and correlate it with the other data that you have seen and you are familiar with, which is the ECHOR trial, to see whether or not the use of this particular sulfonylurea dimicron MR is associated with the same kind of adverse effects such as hypoglycemia and weight gain and perhaps suggest to you that the problem of weight gain and, some, and hypoglycemia may not be the same. End up with reminding everybody about the guideline and show you a couple of cases. So, so the question that I posed is a very common question that they say, look, the beta cell is being stimulated by the sulfonylurea. Am I exhausting them earlier? And I suggest to you the answer is no. Why? It's because of data coming out of these large-scale studies that you are familiar with. This is the UK PDS that you have seen in the past. That when patients are newly diagnosed to have diabetes, at the time that they were recruited into this study, about 50% of the beta cells have already been lost. But in the three different arms of the study, you will see that the beta cell loss is roughly parallel. What is the difference? Diet and conventional in the pink, in the purple is metformin, and in the yellow is sulfonylurea. And you will see that there is a slight increase when starting sulfonylurea. That is increase is actually because sulfonylurea stimulate the beta cell. And so using the HOMA beta as the assessment for beta cell function, you will see a slight improvement, apparent improvement. But then when you look at over the next five to six years, you will see that the beta cell loss as assessed by this equation, the HOMA beta, is exactly the same whichever arm you use. If you thought and if you believe that sulfonylurea causes beta cell exhaustion, that line shouldn't look like this, but instead should drop like that. But in that case, it, it has not been shown to be the same, uh, to be the case. So then the question is, okay, that's one trial that has shown me that sulfonylureas are not bad for the, cell, for the beta cell. Is there any other evidence or trial to show a similar result? The answer is yes. This comes from the ADOP study. The ADOP study that was uh, done in, again, type 2 diabetic patients. There were three arms in that study going on for a five-year period. Metformin in the green, rosy glitazone in the blue, and in the red, glibenclamide. Very similar kind of curves compared to the one I've just shown you. In fact, the loss of beta cells are roughly parallel after the initial blood upwards for sulfonylurea, such that I think you should agree with me 
that the rate of beta cell decline seems similar over the four to five period in each of these arms. There may be a slight uh, sort of suggestion that with rosiglitazone, there is less of a fall, less steep fall with rosiglitazone. However, I think the, the purpose is to show you and to reassure you that sulfonylureas do not accelerate beta cell loss. So with regards to the first question, do beta cells get exhausted the longer the person has had diabetes? The answer is yes. But do sulfonylureas actually form one of the reasons for that beta cell exhaustion? The answer is no. And you will agree with me that it has not been proven in both large-scale studies that I've reviewed with you. Next, let's talk about how you and I would manage the patient with type 2 diabetes in our care. We have to recognize, well, if you have a person that looks like this, with a stomach that sort of sticks out, um, you have no problems understanding that that person has a significant amount of insulin resistance, but also that the beta cell will contribute to the hyperglycemia. But I'd like to also propose to you that the data for the Asian type 2 diabetic suggests that we have a significant beta cell dysfunction as well. This data that I'm showing you is from Jap Japan. And you will see that in this very elegant study, they actually reviewed patients with normal glucose tolerance, moving through pre-diabetes, impaired glucose tolerance, and then over diabetes. You will recognize with regards to insulin resistance, as assessed by Homer IR, that you actually increase by about twofold increase in insulin resistance moving across the different categories of glucose intolerance. But for beta cell function, you drop from about a tenfold uh, beta cell function to about a twofold, uh, two times, sort of like unit. Uh, when you look at insulinogenic index. What is insulinogenic index? It is actually just the insulin that's stimulated when you give a person a glucose tolerance test. At zero minutes versus 30 minutes, this is the amount of insulin that a normal glucose tolerant person will be able to produce, while a patient with diabetes produces about 20% of that amount. And you, it is about 50% when you are pre-diabetic. So I think you will agree with me that the Japanese type 2 diabetic and similar results from Korea and Thailand show that in fact, the type 2 diabetic that you and I manage have got a very significant beta cell dysfunction and defect. And therefore, it would not be appropriate not to give something that addresses the beta cell in our trial attempt at getting our patients to glucose improvement. So just to show you a pair of slide, this is the kind of patients you will I see with type 2 diabetes, but this is also the kind of patients that we will see. This man is actually hiding. This is an Indian patient. Uh, just to reinforce the fact that for a given body mass index, we might hide a little bit more fat in our abdomen, more so in, the, in, in Indian nations, but I think also in the Chinese and Malay as well, and I'm sure <coughs> Myanmar as well. But we also have a beta cell secretory dysfunction. At this point, I'd like to say this is a slide of patients that we took on the diabetes camp, which means all these patients have diabetes. And you can imagine, look at that woman. She's actually quite normal in body mass index, right? So now let's look at the evidence garnered and gathered from the advanced trial. And as Professor Cooper has mentioned, we have four Asian countries involved. Majority of the patients from Asia came from China, with the second most from India. Malaysia and Philippines actually did, uh, were able to get some patients recruited in this trial. And I'm very proud to have been involved in this study, because at the beginning, when we were tr expecting the dis results four to five years ago in 2008, we were kind of disappointed when we were thinking, hmm, you know, it's gonna look as though you won't see uh, macrovascular outcomes and benefits because we were having some clue to the outcome, outcomes of this result. But then when we heard that the ACCORD trial was causing excess mortality, the lack or the neutral effect of improving glucose control took some prominence and significance. 
That means when we actually improved glucose control, we did not do it at the expense of excess mortality. And I think for that, I, I'm very thankful for actually the advanced study that was able to conclude. So you've seen this slide from Professor Cooper to show that patients who recruited had type 2 diabetes for about 10 years. 